All right, everybody. Hi, right, thanks for being here. Um, this is design, storytelling, and games and film. So let's make sure I can share my notes here. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit some of the questions I like to ask when I'm approaching audiovisual projects. Um, try to get you guys to start, you know, asking some of these good questions, making kind of informed design decisions when you go to actually be working on games or film. I know there's kind of a, a mixed bunch of people and different backgrounds and kind of different areas of study and focus here. So I'll be talking a bit. I know this class, I think, mostly is focused on games, if I'm not mistaken, but I'll be pulling some examples from some films and animation I like as well and talking about some of those kind of projects I've worked on. Um, and then I'll be talking about uh, some of the tools, you know, not just the theoretical side of things, but how do we actually take some of these ideas and then, you know, apply it in our work. So. Who am I? Yes, uh, my name is Duncan. I'm an American concept artist, art director, and 3D generalist. Uh, I've worked in the entertainment industry for the last six years now, um, both as a freelancer, um, in-house for a game development studio here in Estonia called Derivco for the last three years. Uh, and then now I own my own design studio, uh, Tesseract Studios, and we mostly do co-development with video gaming companies, which essentially means, you know, a lot of times uh, in the middle of production cycles, they need some extra help, whether it's uh, concept art or, you know, free models. So it tends to be cheaper to go to co-development studios, work on contract as opposed to you know, hiring new people and getting them on board, you know, they just kind of sign a contract and we're good to go right away. And it's quite fun. Um, it's challenging because typically, oh, sorry. Typically, uh, you know, you're only working on a project for a couple of weeks or a couple of months before you switch to something else. Um, so you never really get to see the end final product of what you're working on. Uh, but it's good for me because I like working on different kinds of stuff all the time and it's quite a good challenge. Uh, and then we work with, um, animation of the effects videos as well, doing mostly concept art. So they'll come to us with a, a sequence or some green screen footage, and it's essentially our job to design, you know, what is this shot going to look like in the end. And so in my studio, I take various roles, oftentimes, uh, depending on how much work there is to do. You know, I'm more of like an art director, producer type of role, so just making, hiring other artists, making sure their work is consistent with the grand vision of the director. Um, you know, the other people working on it and, you know, just making sure everybody knows what they're doing, giving feedback to people, this kind of stuff. So, the load. Uh, here's some of my work, as you can see, you know, uh, in kind of environment design, for video games, you know, top stuff. Uh, this was for the VFX company, designing a shop for them. Uh, again, more like kind of keyframe sort of environment art, so a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, I hope I at least sort of know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, so let's get into it. What is world building, right? Um, the way I like to think of it, creating an environmental story around your protagonist that supports and helps to shape the narrative experience, right? Um, humans are visual creatures, okay? Millions of years of evolution has taught us to pay attention to our surroundings. We get a lot of information from, okay. we get a lot of information from the world around us. Um, just looking at something, we can usually tell how old it is, uh, whether we should touch it or not. I mean, you saw this in the wild, even if you didn't know what it was, obviously you know what a scorpion is, but just looking at that, is that the kind of thing you want to go up and pet? Probably not, right? Um, and again, it's because we have this bright red stinger here, I and mean, that tells us instinctually that is not something that we should probably be messing around with. Um, yeah. So looking at these weapons on the screen, okay, this was some art done for Lord of the Rings, concept art. Uh, what can we infer about the culture that maybe made these weapons? Anybody? That 
hazard we put together. Okay, great. So that's looking at the materials, right? Uh, anybody else? It's, Any ideas? Uh, it's outer board made, like it doesn't really look human. Okay, sure. Otherworldly. Quite crude, right? It's not practical for something. Okay. <laughs> Everything has a pointy end. Yeah, this clearly it's not the culture that has developed metalwork, right? We perhaps don't have a great understanding of um, aesthetic design. You know, they're very roughly hewn. They're made from stone and obsidian. Um, we might think that the people that made this were quite sort of primitive, savage, sort of brutal kind of people, right? Or creatures. Um, so we get a lot about the. Uh, we can tell a lot about uh, cultures and people from the sort of tools they make. Um, Sorry, can I ask? Sure. What's the point of, like, there's the pointy end, and then there's another pointy end. Like, what's Hurting on? people, I presume. Uh, actually, <laughs> that's, uh, not for working this big. Uh, it's on the long, it's on the shoulder, it's on the uh, outward and long strap. It's on the outward and long staff for the suspension catching and for uh, hooking through the wall horseback. It's on the sword, it's fancy, and it looks cool, and it has no practical purpose besides making it too heavy to use properly and actually making it weaker. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. So, um, we on? This is, um, maybe some of you played this game, Skyrim. This town is called Isolation. Sorry, Solitude. <laughs> Excuse me. Why do you think they called it that? Well, it's literally built onto this cliffside, right? It's hard to get to. It's remote. It's hard to access. Okay, what does that tell us about the sort of people that might be living there? What does that tell us about the sort of relationship that this town might have to other political factions in the, in the greater world, right? So this is sort of embedded narrative information. These were extremely um, intentional choices on the behalf of the designers. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this movie, Arrival, and Yves Villeneuve. In my opinion, he is probably one of the best directors working right now. I absolutely love his movies. Most recently, Dune, uh, Blade Runner 2049, Arrival, Sicario, Prisoners. I mean, excellent cinematography and the production design is just fantastic. Um, the plot of this movie, essentially, aliens touch down at various points around Earth. Nobody knows why they're there and nothing comes out. Every 18 hours, a hatch opens up from the bottom of the ship and the scientists are sort of brought up into this, this cavity, right, where they're allowed to stay in there for a certain period of time and, and interact with these aliens. And so, the main protagonist then is Amy Adams. She plays a, uh, in our renowned linguist that's brought into, oh, sorry, I'm forgetting to, two screens here. <laughs> uh, she's brought in to communicate with the aliens, right? They speak a different language. Humans are trying to figure out what they're doing there. Now look at the room that they're in, completely barren, right? White at the end. Um, the central comp, conflict of this story, and most of the, the story takes place in this very plain, barren room, but there's this big kind of glass wall at the end, right, which the aliens are behind. Now this was, I think, an intentional choice. It's meant to literally not just are, is the protagonist and these aliens separated by a language barrier, there's an actual physical barrier there. You'll also notice that they're kind of misty and faded into the background. Again, it's just reinforcing this idea that they're this sort of nebulous, unknown force, right? This mysterious kind of thing that they're trying to figure out. So very much an intentional choice, and it reinforces the sort of core narrative of the movie. Um, so right, getting into sort of the practical side of things, what sort of questions do we need to be asking ourselves when we start a project to try to figure out how we can make some of these choices for ourselves? And they just really boil down to the three W's for me, who, where, and why. Um, 
you know, many times in the industry, these questions have already been answered for you. If there's an art director on the project. If it's a game, you know, even a movie too, they'll usually have a big pitch deck or a game design document where there's pages and pages about the characters and the lore, um, you know, visual reference for you to refer to. You know, there's art directors who are going to guide you in some of your design choices. But, um, you know, when you're a student or when you're working on your own projects, you really have to be your own art director and be thinking about these things yourself and answering these questions. So, yeah, here we go. Who? So there's really two sides to this. Um, there's the, the characters themselves in the story, right? Who is the protagonist? What kind of background do they have? Um, you know, what's important to them? What do they do? Why are they in the story? What are they driven by? You know, as much as you can, even if this stuff doesn't come out in the story, as many of these questions you can answer for yourself, it's going to help you down the line making some of these creative decisions, right? Um, the other side of this is the audience, right? Who, who are you? Who do you actually want to be consuming this piece of media, right? What kind of cultural background do they have? That's going to affect how they view certain imagery, certain symbols, right? So you need to answer some of these questions and keep them in the back of your mind as you kind of move toward, forward in the creative process. Uh, does that make sense so far? Anybody? Any questions or take your silence as a no? Um, right, root guy, from Lord of the Rings. You guys know these guys, right? We had to answer some who questions about them. What would you say are some of the defining characteristics of the root guy? Anybody, throw them out there. Scary. Scary. <laughs> Big. Better than orcs. Better than orcs, sure. <laughs> you probably feel a bit like this kid if one of them picked you up, right? Well, <laughs> violent, right? They're crude, they're savage, they don't have any really developed culture or religion. Their you know, language is this guttural sort of thing. They're literally pulled out of the mud at birth and they're you know, slimy, muddy, you know, they're not nice guys. So if you were to sit down and try to design some weapons that were consistent with the characters of derivation, the Urukai, what might they look like? Well, here we go. So again, creating that internal consistency in your story such that, you know, the environments, the props are all feeding into the greater narrative, making, you know, the experience for whoever's playing your game or watching your movie, it helps to immerse them in that world, right? But even in these fantasy and sci-fi worlds, there's kind of internally consistent rules that govern how things happen. Okay, let's see. Where, right? These are kind of no-brainers, I know, but just that's kind of what this is. Where does the story take place, right? What kind of technology is there? Is it, you know, a sci-fi movie that takes place 2,000 years in the future? Hey, do they have access to interstellar travel? Are they primitive tribes? Or some weird combination of the two? All of that's going to determine sort of choices you make as a designer. Um, different cultures, right? Uh, how do they interact with one another? What are the sort of internally consistent values and how do they relate to one another, right? All this stuff you need to be thinking about. Um, and then the other important part of the where, right, is what's the relationship to the main character to the location of the events of the story are taking place. Um, Portal, for example, the main character, they're essentially in a glorified prison, right? That's going to change the sort of design decisions you make as a level artist, uh, as an environment artist, because the central kind of idea around the story is that you're a player trapped in this area, right? You're probably not going to have a ton of like wide open spaces. You're not really allowed to explore wherever you want, as opposed to you know a game like Dishonored, which is a stealth game where it's kind of the opposite. Instead of trying to break out of something, you're often trying to break into something. Uh, and again, that's going to change the sort of uh, decisions you make uh, as an artist. OK, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then this is kind of a really big one. This is the why. Like, what is the story of your story? What's the conflict? What is the protagonist trying to achieve? Why are they doing it? What are the stakes, right? What happens if they fail? What happens if they succeed? How can you kind of embed narrative elements into your game or movie that are feeding into this central narrative? Uh -huh. Let's see. Yeah. So now we've answered some of our main questions. We can actually start to think about, you know, in a practical way, how can we use the tools of design and visual storytelling to kind of to show this to our audience. To um, I know uh, maybe you've seen some of the stuff in your lectures in terms of uh, the sort of stuff you can do, but I just wanted to dive in a bit deeper and kind of explore the sort of form that might take. So. Yeah, so I think the big one for me is, is contrast, right? Finds the state of being strikingly different from something else in juxtaposition or close association. Now, in visual storytelling, there's a bunch of different types of contrast we can use, and I'll go over each of them in the next couple slides. Um, right. First one is value. Um, you know, the contrast between dark and light. Again, going back to Arrival, I think this is such an amazing example of value contrast because the room, the part of the room in which the scientists are in is all black. The part of the room in which the aliens are in is all white. Okay? Again, it's setting up this juxtaposition, this, this, this central conflict is between the protagonist and the aliens inside. They don't understand each other. You know, they're on opposite sides of this wall. Not just that. You know, there's opposite colors on each part, and it's no accident that she is also wearing white. You know, she has a black shirt, but she has this white vest on. Now, why is that? And I would argue it's because actually she's the bridge between the two worlds, right? She's the linguist. She's the one who's decoding what these aliens are saying and, and crossing that, you know, not just language barrier, but in this case, the color barrier as well. Um, what symbol does the color scheme remind you of? Anybody? Yin and Yang. Ah, I like it. Exactly. Yin and Yang is a concept of dualism describing how obviously opposite or contrary forces may actually be complementary, interconnected, and interdependent in the natural world, and how they may give rise to each other as they interrelate one another. Right, now, spoiler alert, if any of you haven't seen this movie, you don't want to know how it ends, plug your ears. But uh, this is very relevant to the movie because actually it turns out that these aliens are humans only thousands of years in the future. And they are actually not separate. They're two sides of the same coin. There's this whole element of you know, the inter kind of connectedness of time and all this stuff. So I would argue that this is you know, a very deliberate um, metaphor in the movie. Maybe, you know, you're not actually consciously thinking of this while you're watching. But this is the subtext that, as an audience, you're picking up on some of these metaphors, some of the, the color choices. It's all kind of feeding into the central narrative and you know, adding emotional weight to it. So uh, color contrast. Um, these are two frames from the movie Klaus, Netflix animation. Uh, this is uh, Spa Studios down in Spain. I think it's directed by Sergio Pablos. Uh, absolutely fantastic movie, especially if you have kids. It's a great, feel good Christmas movie. But the production design and the animation is absolutely gorgeous. Um, the main kind of central conflict of this story takes place in this kind of remote northern village um, that's kind of defined by the conflict between two warring families, the Elimbos and the Crumbs. Now, this, this war between the two sides has gone for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's really like the defining characteristic of this town and the story. And in this scene, you know, an Elingbo child and a Krung child were found playing together. You know, this violates the rules of their society, and they're being brought before the matriarch and the patriarch, and they're being kind of led through this kind of hall of, I don't know, fame or glory, or talking about the past wars they've had with one another. And again, the way, you know, in the movie, it's cutting between kind of this scene and this scene, and you see with the color choices, uh, the problems are always kind of very muted blues and greens, 
and the young bow is this very kind of warm, bright color palette. Again, just that color contrast immediately sets up in your mind as a viewer, these are opposing sides. Even though you already know that, you know, because you're paying attention to the story, you have to support that with your visual choices as well. Well, you don't have to, but when you do, it makes it much more interesting to look at an impactful film, I think. And this is where, um, even if you're not strictly an artist, knowing some color theory is really useful. Um, you know, when we talk about contrasting colors, we're really talking about complementary colors. So whatever is opposite on the color wheel. So in this case, you can see you have blues opposite, you know, blues and greens opposite the reds and oranges. Uh, again, very intentional choice on behalf of the, uh, the production designers. The other type of contrast is um, shape and size. So this might be where you have, you know, a really huge tower next to a really small person. You know, again, maybe if the narrative of your story is, you know, it's this really small person trying to over overcome great odds, you know, you can use scale to sort of accentuate this kind of dynamic in your story. Um, it's also a good way to show your audience what they should pay attention to. Um, you know, for example, obviously it's kind of the main foreground of this image, but, you know, the shapes of this kind of, I don't know what this is, dodecahedron is very much in contrast to the sort of natural kind of farmland, pastoral landscape in which it's in. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't have the same impact, I don't think, if it was, you know, in a field full of these kind of weird metal shapes, right? It says something to us as viewers about what might be happening in this world. So the next tool we have at our disposal is metaphorical imagery. Um, this was an environment concept done for the game Raid Shadow Legends. I think the idea was that this was supposed to be sort of like a boss fight area. So the player comes up here and they fight some, you know, big boss. But uh, what does this look like to you guys? What does this remind you of? Anybody? Clock. Clock? Watch. Watch. The sun? To me, it kind of looks like a spider web. Oh. Yeah. You see that? What happens in the spider web if you're a bug? Right? You're in trouble. There's a spider coming for you. Um, and again, as a player, maybe you're not necessarily going to pick up on this, but the more you pay attention, the more you can kind of embed these supporting elements into your game or your story, um, the more depth it's going to have, the more you're going to connect with your audience, not on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. So the other type of tool we can use is shape language. Um, there's all sorts of applications for this. Uh, you saw with those weapons, the shape language, kind of these very sort of jagged shapes. So I've taken two kind of mountain landscapes here. I've saturated them so you're not paying attention to the colors. Um, and you can see the one on the left is very sort of soft, rounded shapes, as opposed to the one on the right. You have all these sort of jagged mountain peaks. And just looking at those, you can imagine maybe what sort of gameplay experience you might have in this place versus this one. Or if it was a movie, what sort of events are going to be taking place here? What sort of events are going to be taking place there? Right? Um, things to think about. Uh, here's another example of shape language from Lord of the Rings. Uh, they just released a bunch of the old concept art they did for the first three movies. Um, what was this? Way to workshop. So uh, I was having fun looking at those. But you can see, um, all of these are helmet designs, right? They all functionally do the same thing. But we can tell a lot about who might be using these helmets just from the sort of shape language they're using. Um, this guy, is he nice or not nice? Probably not nice, right? Because he's, I mean, this, this helmet looks skeletal. It's all these kind of pointy, jagged shapes. I mean, it just screams death and aggression. Uh, in opposition to this one, which is probably a bit more similar to the sort of helmets normal humans use, but this is from the writers of Rohan. Again, you sort of have a horse motif. Horses are very important in this culture, and you can tell there's just a lot more kind of thought given to um, aesthetic considerations. So again, embedding information, 
into your designs. So that's what this is all about. Um, and then there's sort of the experience. Now this is going to change. Um, you have a lot uh, more flexibility when you're making games in terms of the sort of experience you can give people, I think, because there's this added dimension of, you know, the player actually has some agency in terms of where they want to go, the sort of choices they make. But that can be really interesting to play around with because oftentimes you're putting your player into a position where they're having to make choices or being confronted with situations and making choices that they wouldn't necessarily make in real life. Um, you know, I was watching a GDC talk and I think it was the, uh, the game level artist behind uh, Uncharted and she was saying our sequences in the, in, the move, in the game, they really wanted the player to feel like they were sort of oppressed and scared and so, you know, reinforcing that with the level design choices meant putting the player in a really tight cave, it's really poorly lit, right? The ceiling's low, you don't have a very wide field of view, it's all kind of reinforced trying to disorient the player, right? And trying to elicit some kind of emotional response in them. As opposed to, you know, if you were a player and you came out onto a mountaintop like this with an extremely wide vista, well, the feeling you get as a player, uh, similar to the feeling you get as a, as a movie watcher, is going to be very different. And transitioning from, you know, one to the other can be a really powerful storytelling tool as well. Um, great, so that was kind of the questions and the tools. Uh, any questions from you guys so far? Otherwise, there will be some time at the end, I think. Uh, if not, um, let me move on. So I'll talk a little bit now about one of the projects uh, I'm currently working on. One of the unfortunate things about the entertainment industry is the vast majority of paid work you're doing is pretty much under strict NDAs. So often there's a period of Sometimes as much as five years before you can show the work that you did, if you can ever show it, because more often than not, projects get canceled, they don't release you from your NDAs, and then you know the work is just floating off in the universe somewhere. But uh, this is a game I work on, just kind of as a passion project. Um, the lead developer uh, is a Ukrainian environment artist who works for NVIDIA. Um, it's a sci-fi horror adventure game with elements of mysticism. Uh, it's point and click. Uh, it's not fully isometric because you can actually kind of rotate the camera around your character. You can switch to a first person view, but it's very much supposed to be reminiscent of kind of 90s point and click adventure games that uh, I grew up playing Sanitarium, um, Dabble 2 a little bit, uh, these kind of things. So in the first episode, Wake Up, it focuses on the inhabitants of an underground shelter struggling to survive against an interloping evil. So I will show the the uh, the trailer. Let's see. Oh, we do have some sound. Okay. So yeah, there you go. Uh, you can download the demo on Steam. 
on we at least play the first 30 minutes, uh, but that should give you kind of some taste of. Yeah. Uh, is it actual gameplay or footage? Uh, I... Or a mix of. Uh, it's a mix of yeah actual gameplay, uh, you know, just yeah. taken from the engine and actual kind of. Um, you know, cinematographic sequences that we uh, that we just filmed. Um, so. Okay, it's just not full screen anymore. Um, yeah, so the who for this game it focuses around this character, on Hell. Uh, he wakes up in this room. He has no memories of how he got there. Um, his head hurts, his face is wrapped in these bandages. Um, it's unclear if this is some kind of waking nightmare or so what the deal is. So as a character, you sort of wake up, you know nothing about where you are, and you're slowly kind of uncovering parts of the story, um, you know, through pieces of uh, letters and pictures you discover along the way, talking to the other player characters, non-player characters, excuse me. Um, and so, yeah, the, the sort of central conflict, of course, there's these kind of evil creatures hunting people on the corridors of this underground shelter. But ultimately, the conflict is really an internal one of Angel trying to discover who he is, what he's going on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it takes place in this kind of near future post apocalyptic underground shelter. Again, as a player, you don't really know what happened, why all these people are living underground. Presumably something horrible happened above ground that's made the land uninhabitable, but you don't really know. And that's what you're sort of being driven to find out and discover along the way. It's full of garbage and refuse, you know, the, the flooded corridors. You know, obviously the people that live there are just trying to scrape together some existence from whatever objects and food they can find. Yeah. Again, I, I think I hit on this a little bit. But um, yeah, the why the central conflict is who is this guy? What is going on? Why is he here? So, so that's where I come in. So I've been working on this game as a concept artist and a level designer. Um, it's a pretty small team. We're all just sort of working on this in our free time. So we all kind of wear a lot of different hats, but it's really a lot of fun. Um, so I was tasked with creating an underground train station where um, the player has to restore power to a train in order to you know, advance to another part of the game level. Um, sort of the characteristics I was told it needs to have, there needs to be some NPCs to interact with, uh, there needs to be some interesting puzzle opportunities, um, it needs to stay consistent to the art direction of the game, obviously. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, you know, as you saw, there's kind of junk everywhere. So, you know, it's kind of about how do we indicate to the players uh, what's going to be important, what they should pay attention to, you know, um, where can they go, what's out of bounds. And again, because you sort of have this third person uh, isometric thing and the camera can sort of rotate freely around, I have to be really aware as a designer um, how I construct these game levels because you don't want the camera clipping into walls or getting stuck behind things. I mean, it's just, be a headache if you have stuff in the way. So it's better just to design with that in mind and not have to figure these things out down the line. So typically when I start a project like this, I really just start with a crappy looking floor plan like this. Just figure out, you know, what are the main spaces, what are the main volumes. Um, of course, before this even, you spend a lot of time gathering reference, right? And that's um, screenshots from the game levels that have already been made so I can stay consistent with what's been done already. You know, I'm looking at photos of decrepit underground subways and old rail Soviet rail cars and, you know, piles of garbage. Um, basically, the more time you spend looking for good reference, the easier your job is going to be down the line. So I knew in this area. You know, there needed to be some kind of entrance, obviously. The player has to get in there. Um, I knew it was a train station, so I was looking at kind of basis design, a lot of the sort of layouts of, you know, underground metro stations where you have kind of a central platform and then two platforms on the side, and then, you know, the rail cars 
in these areas to go in kind of both directions. Um, I knew that there was going to need to be some place for the player to go into the, you know, some kind of control room or something so they could restore power to the trains. So there's sort of like a, an office here. Um, and then I decided, you know, trying to think about the storytelling in the game a little bit more. Um, I wanted to make this into my idea was that, you know, it's, it's underground, it's all abandoned, but the, the people living underground made this into sort of like an outdoor flea market. Like, have you ever been to the, I don't know what they call it, the, the market behind Baltion, where it's just like the little, little tin shacks, right? I was, I went there one day and I was just taking pictures of all of these because they have so much character, you know, there's so much story to these little rundown shacks, you know, all these, you know, material, interesting materials and graffiti and, you know, the odd objects that are being sold, all this stuff. So I wanted to incorporate that a little bit into these designs and you'll see a couple slides what that looks like in the end. But uh, yeah, then the next step for me is to actually do a 3D blackout. So I did this in 3DS Max, really just simple shapes. I take the floor plan, I just sort of, you know, build it up, extrude the walls, et cetera, et cetera. And that allows me to sort of play around with, you know, the actual dimensionality of the gameplay space. Uh, you know, I can actually, obviously you can take this into Unity or Unreal Engine. And, you know, if you already have camera systems and movement systems set up, you can actually, you know, walk your little character around. And as a concept artist in the industry, often this is what we're getting. This is where I would step in. Uh, they would give you like your gray box block out, maybe some renders from the engine, and it's your job as a concept artist to essentially just paint over the environment and make it look like a real place and not just a bunch of gray boxes, right? So this isn't actually uh, the train station area. This is for another area of the game, uh, much bigger, but gives you some idea of what that process looks like. Um, because oftentimes when you build things up in 3D, you'll discover a lot of issues you hadn't really thought about when it was just kind of a 2D map. Um, and the sooner on you can address some of those things before you get into actual production of producing the art and the 3D environment assets and stuff like this, which is extremely time consuming and expensive. Um, if you can fix, think about some of those issues ahead of time, you're, everybody's going to thank you down the line. So. You have similar constraints as a you know production designer for film as well. Um, you sort of know where the camera's going to be going, what's going to be seen. Uh, you have some idea. Uh, you can kind of anticipate ahead of time what sort of things might be an issue. Um, and as you know, if you don't work on any productions, you're going to save a lot of time and money down the line if you can anticipate some of these problems. So yeah, in this game, we have quite a large library of environment assets that we've um, mostly like props that we've bought or made ourselves. So I just have a huge kind of library of these assets that I can pull from, um, sort of decorate the scene, you know, all this wood and these sort of light fixtures and stuff. I can just kind of drag and drop and they're quite modular. So I have a lot of flexibility in terms of how I can put them together. So that's, that's kind of the next step as I start really figuring out aesthetically, what it's going to look like, what sort of objects are going to be there. Really trying to find these kind of interesting kind of sub-compositions. You really give some thought to how you lay out objects. So it's, it's not just interesting to look at, but tell some sort of story, right? Um, you'll notice that there's this huge kind of military barricade here. Well, you know, as a player, not knowing not too much about this world, you start to ask yourself, why is there this military barricade in the middle of like a subway station market? Well, they're probably trying to keep something out, right? So again, this kind of embedded narrative elements that are hinting at the sort of world these people are living in. Um, I've also, it's great with working with 3D as well, because you can already put some lights in there and start thinking about how this might look um, in the engine. Again, with this game, it's lighting is extremely important because it allows you to, you know, draw the player's eye around, let them know what might be important, what things probably they don't need to go investigate. Um, as you can see, the sort of main interaction points, this military barricade and this kind of fence here, which you can open and go down, are quite well lit. And I did that intentionally because 
that's what I want people to pay attention to. I don't want them to have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out where they need to go and all this kind of stuff. So, and then this is what the final concept looks like. I'll just, uh, you know, take a 3D render that you just saw and take it into Photoshop and just go and bring some life to it. You know, that wear and tear, um, just make it look pretty. Uh, and then I can hand this off to, you know, the uh, National Environment Artists, the guys that are working with Unity. Um, they can take the 3D block that I've done and start the laborious process of actually making it look good. So, uh, and then this is kind of the other area of the station. You can see, thinking about sort of embedded narrative elements, um, this whole kind of part of the subway is completely flooded. You have these floating cars here. That tells you something about the events that might have come before, right? There's this tunnel that's completely collapsed on this train car. You have, you know, people here made some kind of makeshift bar on one of the train cars, you know? All this stuff hints at the sort of stories that might be happening in this space. What's come before you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, again, using light to draw the player's eye around, let them know what might be important or interesting or they should investigate. Um, yeah, and then the final area of this was the sort of station office. And again, I just I do spend a lot of time making sure it might just look like a mess of objects thrown everywhere, but I assure you I spend a lot of time making sure these compositions look interesting and dynamic and just messy enough and a good mix of you know, big shapes and medium shapes and small shapes and you know kind of interesting uh, dimensionality and contrast there. So yeah. Moving on, I think that's about it. Yeah, so that's me. I hope uh, some of this has been mildly interesting, at least. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yes? Yes, I have a question. So, um, like, that was just one level, right? In the game. You Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How long did it take to you know, complete it? So, It took me about four or five days to do all the modeling for maybe three or four days to do the modeling for the whole area. Um, and again, there's a lot of like all the pipes and stuff and the train cars I made from scratch. So that was quite time consuming. Um, because those pipes have to be, you can see, you like, I really kind of want to make kind of interesting compositions about all these and how they kind of weave around and interconnect and stuff. So I spent a lot of time. Um, so I mean, in two or three days, I actually got to get the basic block out. Um, you know, not just that gray box one I showed you, but actually like the steps and the railings and stuff like this. And then another maybe two days to kind of fully decorate the whole scene. And then, you know, a couple hours for each of those kind of concept renderings like this. So start to finish this whole area, you know, two weeks. Yeah. Eight or nine work days. Huh? Well, see, I wasn't working on it like continuously every day. It was just sort of when I found time. But uh, yeah, a four to five hour chunks I was working on it typically. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. Sure. So basically, when you work together with uh, game designers, mm -hmm. uh, at what stage do you create concept art for those levels? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a really small kind of indie team, so it's really not going to be the same kind of workflow you'd find in a bigger sort of production. So I don't think it's going to be like, indicative of how things typically go in like real established game studios. But the point at which I come in is they've sort of figured out, um, you know, we need this area. This is where it fits into the sort of basic narrative. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's like filled it. So I quite like that because the brief is pretty open ended. It's just like make a train station and I can kind of just kind of take it in whatever sort of creative direction I want. Of course, along the way, I'm checking in with the kind of main game designer, main environment artist, just making sure, of, you know, this is kind of what you were looking for, et cetera, et cetera, getting feedback and making changes. But 
it, it happens pretty early on in the process. Mm -hmm. So you do a concept artist and the 3D environment artist and I'm not a 3D environment artist. I should I, I, I can do kind of photorealistic 3D rendering and yeah. stuff, but I don't do the whole kind of high poly, low poly workflow. Yeah. Uh, I mostly just use it as a tool to supplement kind of my 2D work. Or you know yeah. What is your job like in this production? You're helping people, you're doing like this, or you look at like what is your how you can Define this. Uh, I'm making these. I'm the artist that makes these. How would you use it? How would you use it? Yeah. It's taken by the, the environment artists, so the people that are actually making these assets, you know, making the game levels and implementing them into Unity. Um, it's basically used as inspiration for them. As you saw, I actually have, you know, all most of this stuff is in 3D, so they can, you know, all of these assets, they can keep them exactly where they are. They just reconnect all the textures that they're um, go with them. So for that, it's just those are good to go, but they do need to come in and, you know, they'll take, do a ZBrush pass on the stairs, ZBrush pass on the walls, you know, texture all these pipes and stuff, um, and then implement it into the engine. So, yeah. How much do you need to research things previously, like for this? Yeah, for this kind of project, not as much as some. Um, uh, some projects require a lot of, for example, I was working on uh, a game project recently, uh, which I can't really talk too much about, but essentially the brief was it takes place in this world with some kind of combination of sci-fi and medieval. So I was designing these vehicles that had to be, um, you know, medieval looking, but clearly still had some sci-fi technological elements and finding the right balance between those kind of two contradictory Aesthetics was extremely difficult and took a lot of iteration and you know, a lot of research on my behalf in terms of, you know, I was researching, you know, medieval winches and, you know, this, this vehicle had to have some kind of landing gear that came down. So I wanted to do it with kind of the technology available at the time. So, you know, I was looking at kind of medieval wheel and pulley systems and trying to figure out to kind of actual, because, you know, when you're doing things that need to animate, you have to give thought to how is this actually going to animate, right? And that's where uh, using 3D as a 2D designer is extremely useful because some things might look great as a drawing. When you get into actually build them and animate them, you realize that, oh, actually, you have parts that are clipping into one another. This wouldn't work at all. So it really depends on the project. Um, it depends how much, you know, if there is an art director, how much research they've done, how much of an idea they have about what they want. So it really just depends. Yeah. And uh, if you do some, uh, this one for your uh, another session, I mean, uh, uh, what's your general pipeline? Uh, I see you use Story for uh, 3D Max and Photoshop for. Yeah, so for this one, pipeline is 3ds Max. I use V Ray to render it, and then I take it into Photoshop. Um, yeah, I do like a clown pass which essentially gives me, I don't have an example of it here, but it essentially gives every single object kind of has like a matte color to it, which if you use the find edges filter in Photoshop, it'll give you automatic outlines around everything. So then I drop the opacity on that, and I can use just that as a base to sketch over and kind of make it look nice. Uh, so, did that answer your question, sir? Yeah, okay. definitely. And uh, another one, are you self-educated uh, or you with some uh, uh, school uh, or maybe you kind of uh, um, saw some um, educational online courses, maybe you can uh, recommend some. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, yeah. uh, but maybe you can say something like, uh, no, uh, this one it was uh, really great. Yeah, I no, I didn't do any kind of formal education. And I was just kind of learning uh, on the job, which was pretty hard, I must say, um, as a freelancer in the first couple of years. Uh, but I was just kind of, um, you know, getting a little bit of paid work at the beginning. Uh, most of that is like more like illustration for books and cards and stuff like this. Um, but I really wanted to work more in video games, so I was kind of volunteering for small indie projects. Um, none of them ever went anywhere. Most of them don't. 
but it was still a good experience to actually get to work with other artists and you know see a little bit what the kind of production pipeline was like. Uh, yeah, and then I got a job here in Estonia for this game company where I got to learn a lot more kind of 3D stuff and saw that whole side of things. Um, so yeah. Well, you kind of uh, taught yourself. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, during work, but of yeah. course, I watched lots of YouTube tutorials, yeah, yeah. and you know, there's a couple, uh, you know, online course websites that are really quite good. Um, but yeah, I mean, just there's so much information available yeah, on YouTube practice. and online and stuff. You can, practice. Yeah, and then lots and lots and lots of practice. Yeah. How much time take to be able to do this work? Uh, six years. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, I would say. Yeah, it takes a while. Cool, and, yeah. Um, I don't know how it was but like six years ago, but nowadays there's just like the, the competition in many like the art area. So, how mm -hmm. did you get? How did you get started? How did you get the, how did people notice you? Yeah, well, um, you practice a lot, you start making good work, you put it online, but then, uh, you know, a big part, it is a really highly competitive industry, but it's actually pretty small. So, you know, making connections, um, reach out to art directors and clients and, you know, even like indie projects you just think are interesting and you want to volunteer your time for, you know, it's a great way, even if it doesn't really go anywhere, just to make some of those connections. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a slow process, really. You just, you keep at it, you keep making work and putting it online and slowly you build some sort of following and make connections in the industry, people see your work. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd say at the beginning, just say yes to everything, you know. You'll get some small projects and they tend to really suck and not pay that well, but you learn some really good lessons about maybe what sort of things you don't want to be working on, uh, what sort of clients you don't want to be working with, uh, and really you kind of just learn those things through the experience. But uh, again, you know, I think the really big difference between um, good artists and great artists is your ability to tell a story with your work. Um, and this doesn't just, this isn't just concept art, video games and movies, you know, I just started uh, working for a new company as a marketing designer, so doing this marketing and branding stuff. And again, you know, so much of what we're thinking about is what kind of story are we trying to tell, right? It's not just creating beautiful images, we really have to think about, you know, that storytelling aspect of, you know, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is why we're doing it, and whatever kind of work you're doing, be it illustration, short films, video games, um, thinking about those storytelling things are what's really going to like pull in an audience and make them engage with what you're making. Yeah. Hello? So I think that's it uh, for time, right? Cool. Hello. Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn and ArtStation, whatever. Feel free, any of you, to reach out to me if you have any more questions or comments for me. Uh, I'd be happy to hear it. So. Yeah. 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 From time to time. Yeah. What is your power? What is my power? Power. Power. What power do you have? Uh, there are a couple questions. Oh, are there? Sorry, I wasn't even uh, checking. Yeah. How do I do the chat or something? Yeah. Can you see them in the chat? I'm looking at one There's the chat. Ah, yes, right. <laughs> I don't know why the sports kids is open.